Four billion people use rice as their staple, and four billion people eat white rice, not brown rice. People don't realize that traditional cultures have an intact microbiome system because they're not eating this food. So plants have a defense system against being eaten, and they have developed this defense system because plants, unlike animals, can't move, and they can't fight, and they can't hide. So they use lectins, which are sticky proteins that are designed simplistically to make an animal ill or to think twice about eating either the plant or, more specifically, a plant baby. So an evolutionary self-defense mechanism that was brought into a plant's DNA as more animals started to evolve on this earth. Yeah, correct. And plants, you know, were here on earth so long before animals arrived. And the first animals that were plant predators were insects. And there's some pretty compelling evidence that I give in the plant paradox that lectins, among other things, paralyze insects by hitting sugar molecules that occur between nerve endings and prevent that transmission. And actually, just this week, I was visiting with a patient in New York City, just to use an example, who had been told by his neurologist that he had peripheral neuropathy and there was nothing he could do about it. And so we put him on a lectin-limited diet, and within two months, his peripheral neuropathy was completely resolved. And he says, why doesn't my neurologist know about this? I, so... Um, I'm telling them now. And so talk about some of the foods that are out there that are common that have higher amounts of lectins. Um, but before we get into like the preparation of how to like make them lectins safe yeah. or minimize the lectins inside of there, but what are the common foods that are out there that people are eating that have higher amounts of lectins? Yeah, so the common foods are grains and pseudo grains. Um, the lectins in general are on the hull of the grains. So for instance, one of the things that I think has been a huge detriment to our society is the use of whole grain goodness. Cultures traditionally have taken the hull off of grains before they eat them. You will not see a lot of whole grain pasta in Italy. You will not see a lot of whole grain croissants in France. We've traditionally taken the hull off of grains. Four billion people use rice as their staple and four billion people eat white rice, not brown rice. Right, rice is actually one of your uh, main uh, examples that why taking the hull off of rice, so as many people, some people know, some people don't know, when you go to the health food store and you buy brown rice, that's maybe rice in its original form, but we don't traditionally eat that in India and other societies. We spend, I mean, if you look at the process of what it takes to take brown rice and turn it into white rice, it's quite an intensive process. That's exactly right. But And your argument is, why do we spend all this time? Why have cultures traditionally spent all this time to remove the hull? Maybe they know something that we don't know. So what's in the hull that's causing challenges? So the hulls contain these lectins. There are a few hullless grains. Uh, I was just in Ethiopia two weeks ago, and teff is their major grain, and teff does not have a lectin. Sorghum and millet do not have lectins because they're actually hullless grains, but all the other ones have hulls. And so something like brown rice, which I was looking into, kind of came out in popularity in the US in like the 60s yep. as the nutrition movement started. And we started having like nutritional analysis and the analysis on brown rice was, well, it has more vitamins and nutrients. Correct. And white rice by itself is just seen as like a simple carbohydrate. So why eat that? Why not eat the whole thing? And you're saying we're missing the boat. Yeah, and let's we'll step back a minute. Interestingly enough, we have a major defense system. We have multiple defense systems against lectins. This is a you know this is a balance of power. Plants don't want to be eaten, and animals obviously want to eat plants. And so plants build up defense systems against being eaten, and animals develop you know offenses and defenses against the plants' defense. And our microbiome, which I spend you know, a huge amount of all my books talking about, and even more in this book, our microbiome has actually evolved to handle the lectins that we consume. And 
Unfortunately, for instance, grains and beans have only entered our diet in the last 10,000 years. Uh, rice, for instance, is only 8,000 years old. Uh, White rice, traditionally, as societies have eaten it, you're saying it's, it's, it's about 8,000 years old. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Rice was... Which genetically is very recent. Very recent. Very mm -hmm. recent. And I think the less time we've had of exposure to a certain uh, particle in plants, the less we have... A, bacterial species that can eat it. We do have a bacterial species that is known to eat gluten and likes gluten. Uh, gluten, by the way, is a lectin. And when people stop eating gluten and are sensitive to it, that actually bacterial species leaves because it has nothing to eat. Then when they re-expose themselves to gluten, there's no defense against them and they really react to it. So what's happened that I talk a lot about in the plant paradox in, and in the longevity paradox is we pretty much wiped out this microbiome of ours because of, among other things, the antibiotics that we take willy-nilly still and the antibiotics that have been fed to almost all the cows, sheep, pigs, chickens, and even fish that we eat. And so this huge, vast defense system against lectins that has evolved to handle this has pretty much been wiped out. And so people don't realize that traditional cultures have an intact microbiome system because they're not eating this food. So when, when, say, people look at the blue zones and say, well, these people eat, you know, rice and beans. And beans is, was actually the number one food, the conclusion, you know, Dan Buettner going on TV He's telling everybody, what can we learn from the blue zones? They eat a lot of beans. Yeah, and he's absolutely wrong. And I go into that. Uh, for instance, the, the Okinawans. The only official study of the Okinawan diet was done in 1949 by the U.S. government as an occupying force. And it's published. Google it. Uh, I actually reference it. Their diet in 1949 that was 85% a blue or purple sweet potato. 5% of it was white rice, and the other 5% was soy, but it was miso or natto. It was not tofu. And so when someone like Dan, who I respect a great deal, says... Yeah, without that, his work, maybe the Blue Zones wouldn't be out there in the way they're oh, talking yeah, abso about. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but to categorize the Blue Zones with they all eat beans and rice is absolutely not true. Not true. Uh, the Adventist diet is very little in rice. I think I saw rice maybe three or four times in my tenure there over 18 years. But do they eat any beans? And if they are eating beans, do they still today, if we go down and drive, we're in Santa Monica, if we drive down to Loma Linda, are they soaking them? Are they preparing yeah, them they in do, that way? Do exactly. they pressure cook? Or? Yeah, well, they don't pressure cook, but they do soak. But interestingly, in Brazil, where they use rice and beans as their staple, they pressure cook their beans. Um, the mothers teach the kids that you have to pressure cook. Well, growing up, uh, I never was raised in India, but I would travel there every year. And my family's of Indian origin. I can never remember a time where we didn't prepare beans and lentils without pressure cooking. Yeah. In fact, my friends would come to my house as a young child and they were like, what the heck is that thing? I'm like, it's a pressure cooker. And they had no idea. They've never seen one before. And, uh, and so that's traditionally how lentils and beans, and it was primarily out of the, out of the fact of, I didn't, they did, my mom didn't know, or my grandparents didn't know that they're destroying lectins. They were doing it because of speed the same way that somebody uses like an Instapot today right? and, uh, and taste to yeah. infuse it with, you know, the flavors that they wanted to. But the byproduct was, so just a, just a quick question on that. How long, so before pressure cooking, was it slow cooking? Yeah, I think, you know, I go to Tuscany a lot and study these little villages and they actually do beans in a glass jar and they cook it for 48 hours, slow boiling by the, by the side of a fire. Uh, and, you know, I, I sit there and go, you know, these, these people were so smart. They probably, they didn't know why they were doing it, but they always felt so much better when they did it that way. Um, I went to Sicily last fall to, because they're, they love tomatoes. Everything is tomato sauce. And so I would interview chefs and I go, so, you know, what's the secret to tomato sauce? And they go, well, first of all, anyone knows that you have to peel and de-seed your tomatoes to make tomato sauce. And I said, well, what do you mean everybody knows? Well, you know, everybody knows you can't have peels and seeds in tomato sauce because they're lethal. 
Why are they lethal? Well, because my mother taught me. You know, who taught her? You know, her mother. And it turns out that lectins in tomatoes uh, are in the peel and the seeds. And tomato is a very modern introduction. Uh, tomatoes are from the Americas. And right. they were only brought to Europe or to Asia by, you know, Colombian trade 500 years ago. Yeah. And a lot of, por like, Portugal trade and introducing that in uh, and introducing uh, peppers peppers to India, which was only started in the 1600s. Yeah. Prior to that, there was no, Indian food was not spicy the way that we think of spicy food. It had a lot of spices, turmeric and ginger and other things, but it was not spicy. Correct. So even for a lot of people that are out there, because uh, certain nightshade vegetables can have a higher lectin count. Tomato Correct. is one example that you're talking about. And people that are out there sometimes tell me, because I, I, I had, before I knew about the lectin-free diet, I always knew that I was more sensitive to, to tomatoes. And when I stopped, when I would eat out at Indian restaurants and things, I wouldn't feel as, as good. And then I kind of got into my own food journey and stopped eating as much grains and lentils and beans, just because I thought digestively I felt better. Mm -hmm. And gluten as well, I felt better which I want to come back to because I know you have some thoughts on that. Um, but a lot of these foods, your argument is that they're recent. We forget history. They're recent introductions into a lot of societies. With that also being said, I mean, they've been to Italy many times, and there's a lot of places that don't de-skin and de-seed. And would you say that that's a product of modernization and efficiency? Yeah, I think absolutely that's a process of that. Uh, when you go again to these small villages, you really don't, you see the traditional way of, of doing things. I mean, just, you know, personal, as I've written about, my, my grandmother on my mother's side was from France, and she taught my mother to always peel and de-seed tomatoes before she served them. And we had sliced tomatoes that had been, she'd peel it over our stove, uh, just whip the peel off, and then she'd cut them and take the seeds out. And we had sliced tomatoes growing up, but they always had no peels and seeds. And when I went to Yale, it was the first time I ever had a sliced tomato with peels and seeds. And I thought that was the weirdest thing. You know, why would anybody do this? Because, you know, they're, they're crunchy and the skin is tough. And I go, why? what a weird way to eat a tomato. And of course, that's the way everybody else was doing it. So you mentioned one thing about gluten, and then I want to talk about some of the myths and go back into aging. Okay. So you mentioned that uh, a lot of people take out gluten or go on gluten-free diets, then lose their ability to tolerate it. They introduce it back in. Now, I'm not sure if this is true, so I would love you to chime in on it. We had Ocean Robbins, uh, founder of the mm -hmm. Food Revolution, mm -hmm. and, the, and his uh, grandfather started Baskin Robbins. Yep. He said one of the problems with a lot of the genetically modified foods that are out there is that they are genetically modified to increase the lectins in there. Is that true? That's actually true. Uh, part of the way they're genetically modified is to insert lectins. For instance, the snowdrop lectin is put into BT corn. The tomato uh, that most people eat has had a lectin, additional lectins inserted in the tomato because lectins was the plant defense system against right. being eaten by insects. So it's funny, I mean, GMO folks know that if you want to make something more resistant to predation, you insert more genes that produce lectins. And yet, you know, my critics say, oh, lectins don't have anything to do with it. Well, apparently, most people who genetically engineer, you know, crops know a whole lot that lectins are, you know, the defense system. So I guess that's one of the challenges with a lot of the glute, the wheat in, in the U.S., especially because it's GMO, is it, you know, are people reacting to the gluten or are they reacting to the, the GMO foods or the glyphosate? Yeah, I think it's glyphosate. I really do. Um, I think we have to be aware that glyphosate is now used on non-GMO crops as a desiccant. And it's used on almost all wheat, almost all oats, almost all soybeans, almost all canola in this country to dry the, the plant out for because it's easier to harvest. These, you know, huge mega corporations, these uh, combines, these harvesters cost over a million dollars a piece. And you have to have a, a field ready to harvest on a particular day and not depend on weather. 
so what they actually do is, okay, you know, field X is going to be harvested three weeks from now. We're going to go spray field X with Roundup. Field X is going to die. It's going to dry out. And then our 10 combines are going to be there. And then we'll move on to field Y that was sprayed the next day. And so this has been mechanized into drying crops with Roundup so that you can harvest it. And then nobody's going around with a little cloth washing the glyphosate off the corn and the soybeans and the wheat and the oats. They're then fed to animals and they're put in all of our breads, all of our cookies, all of our crackers. You probably saw a couple of weeks ago that they looked at 35 oat products on the shelves in our stores and all of them had, most of them had significant beyond tolerable levels of glyphosate in this product. I mean, Cheerios, for instance, sure. um, granola bars. And so what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that is two things. Uh, glyphosate absolutely makes us more sensitive to gluten, but probably most importantly, People need to realize that Monsanto patented glyphosate as a antibiotic. They did not patent it as an herbicide. And what that means is an antibiotic kills bacteria. That's the definition of an antibiotic. It's a patented antibiotic. So we now know that glyphosate kills our intestinal bacteria. And work out of MIT shows that, forget even all that, glyphosate in and of itself causes leaky gut, breaks tight junctions. So we've unleashed, you know, this Pandora's box. Most California wines have glyphosate in it because the weeds were between the rows were sprayed. Mm. Even a couple organic California wines have glyphosate in them. It's incredible. <laughs> we are living in a modern day experiment. Yeah. And uh, nobody knows how it's going to turn out, but it's not looking good. Okay, I want to go back to the core themes inside your book because there's so much about longevity that we want to touch on. But thank you for giving that basis of, of understanding on, um, on lectins because it's a core part of your work and it's a big part of what you want to introduce into the conversations of, of healthy eating. So in your book, you talk about the myths of... of uh, of aging and longevity, Correct. and the things that we think that supposedly keep us living longer and how they may not be. Now, I wanna to touch on some of those uh, myths. We've already covered a little bit, but mm -hmm. one of the core ones is that, you know, you see a lot of headlines that are out there that talk about the Mediterranean diet and how the Mediterranean diet, which has a lot of research behind it. Absolutely. Uh, is one of the diets that some of these blue zones are eating. What do you like and what do you not like about the Mediterranean diet? And what are some of the myths that are out there about it? Okay. So I think the number one beneficial effect of the Mediterranean diet is the consumption of polyphenols. And polyphenols are plant compounds that we now know our gut microbiome eats and benefits from that and then takes those compounds and makes them available to us. Polyphenols, uh, we used to think that polyphenols were antioxidants, but as uh, the chairman of the poly polyphenol conference that I go to every year says, anyone who thinks that there are antioxidants in polyphenols, just leave the room because I don't have time to convince you that there's no such thing. Because they're not in there? Yeah, they're not in there. Okay. Uh, they work in totally different ways. But so olive oil is a huge part of the Mediterranean diet. And the polyphenols in olive oil probably are some of the most miraculous things that you can ingest. Now, there's a myth that oleic acid, which is mostly what's in olive oil, is somehow this marvelous monounsaturated fat that's really good for you. There's nothing particularly unique about monounsaturated fat like oleic acid. It's what that oil contains in terms of the polyphenols that are the beneficial part. And the more polyphenols it contains, the better, quite frankly. Why do we want olive oil? Number one, it grows brain cells. And that was, I think, the striking finding out of, out of the Spanish study, the PredMed study, that looked at 65-year-old people 
to simplify it, uh, one group had to use a liter of olive oil per week. You know, two of these, basically. Right. A and massive they, amount. They actually had to exchange their bottle at the clinic and get a new one every week. So that was their control. The second group ate the equivalent amount of raw nuts. And the third group ate a low-fat Mediterranean diet. So they all ate a Mediterranean diet. And the initial study was for memory. And it turns out the olive oil group and the nut group actually had pr improved memory over the five years of the study. Improved. The low-fat group had diminished memory, which, you know, you'd expect. You're getting older. So it actually, we now know, looking at how that happened, is that the components in olive oil actually stimulate brain-derived neurotropic factor. BDNF. BDNF. So why wouldn't you, you know, want to consume this stuff? The other thing that is fascinating that came out of work from the, at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, we know that bacteria in our gut love to take certain animal proteins, particularly carnitine and choline, and make a rather nasty compound called TMAO, which absolutely stiffens blood vessels, and probably is a major factor in atherosclerosis. Components in olive oil and balsamic vinegar and red wine actually paralyze bacteria. They don't kill the bacteria, but they paralyze the enzyme systems of bacteria so they can't take choline and carnitine and turn it into TMAO. And you know, it, it, it's actually huge credit to the Cleveland Clinic researchers who originally wanted to prove that animal protein is really bad for you because it produces TMAO. And then they said, well, wait a minute. You know, in the Mediterranean diet, they, you know, they eat sausages and salamis and they eat a lot of fish, uh, but they don't have much heart disease. What gives? What's going on? What are they doing? Yeah, what are they doing? And lo and behold, they found these components that, you know, paralyze the bacteria so they can't make these. And so I've heard you say on our, our, our you were on my friend's uh, podcast, uh, Mike Mutzel. So you talked about one of the things that was traditional, let's say in, in Italy and some other places in the Mediterranean, that this could be one of the reasons why people would have wine with a meal. Absolutely. Yeah, and again, we can get into you know the social aspects of uh, wine consumption, and the striking thing is that wine is a beverage that's consumed with a meal. It's not consumed at happy hour, right. um, and so I think we're we're beginning to understand that there are components of the Mediterranean diet that prevent some of the bad things from happening. And I argue in the book, and there's evidence that, for instance, grains and beans may in fact be a negative part of the Mediterranean diet that's compensated for by all these positive aspects of the Mediterranean diet. We have to avoid these oils, and it is incredible. They are in everything. I mean, when you walk into even Whole Foods, go pick up a packaged food item and try to find a food, a packaged food that does not have a refined vegetable oil in it. It is so, so, so challenging. Um, so you really have to do kind of be vigilant about it. And the easiest way to avoid it is to eat whole foods, to eat real, clean, whole foods and prepare them yourself. Um, but yeah, it's 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 landmines out there when it comes to refined vegetable oils. But um, I think we're going to be talking about those in 10, 20 years, like we talk about cigarettes like it's they we we know they're causing damage to our cellular biology number three sushi tell us why sushi <laughs> was one of the items that scored very low which means that it had a big impact on our blood sugar which leads to these roller coasters which leads to in the short <clears throat> term increased belly fat lack of focus crashes in the long term can lead to a whole host of other chronic diseases that we mentioned earlier. So why sushi? You know, I think sushi probably was a one of our low scores is for a couple of reasons. One, rice is just spikes a lot of people. Like white rice tends to be a, a really big spiker. And we saw that we see that amongst a lot of our members. Um, I personally 
rice in any context gets me 40, 50 points above my baseline. So I have to be very judicious with when I'm eating rice. And now I'm a huge fan of alternatives like cauliflower rice or broccoli rice. Um, the other thing is that with sushi, a lot of times sushi rice is sweetened and may have some sugar and vinegar and other stuff in there to make it taste good. So that's something to just maybe ask about when you go to certain restaurants. Yeah, there's um, one right down the street that all my friends used to love to go to. It's called Sugarfish, right? Yeah. It's a great place, you know, shout out to them. But yes, the sh- <laughs> the rice is sweetened, which is why people love it. Absolutely, yeah. And, and so that's something to think about. I think it's fun to learn. And the other thing is, um, so fish is going to have um, a bit of fat and a bit of protein, but I would say the ratio of like rice to fish is often pretty, pretty low. There's a lot of rice, not a lot of fish. So there's so many alternatives that you can do though. Like one thing is make sure you're starting your sushi dinner with some, <clears throat> you know, non-carby uh, foods. We know that like food sequencing, adding for instance, vegetables or protein before we eat the carbohydrates can really be very helpful in blunting our response. So there's actually been studies where they've given people chicken and vegetables before like a pasta dish or a bread dish, and they have a much lower glucose response than if they eat the the bready pasta dish before the chicken and vegetables. So just swap out the timing. So that might mean getting a seaweed salad, getting some edamame, which is going to have fat, protein, you know, before you get your rice. Um, where typically at a lot of restaurants, you know, they might be serving the bread first. Or the tortilla chips. Or the tortilla chips. Exactly. And just hold off on that and actually first go for a salad, maybe some protein inside of that, some fats, as you mentioned. Guacamole so, with guacamole. vegetables. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and most restaurants will do that for you, right? They have the vegetables there. So I love when, when me, my family, we go to Mexican restaurants, we will ask for just like, can we get the guacamole and just some cut vegetables. Totally. Start with that first. And then, sure, we might have some corn tortillas or whatever later on, but I have seen a difference in my glucose response when we do that. Yeah. So that's something I think you can do at sushi restaurants. Also, like, lean into um, sashimi, you know, just getting, like, the fish maybe without the rice underneath it and really appreciating that flavor of the fish um, without without all the carbs. Um, and and maybe just stick to a smaller amount of actual sushi with rice. Um I've also become a huge fan of cauliflower rice sushi, which I will probably get some people totally rolling their eyes listening to this, but it's totally worth trying. Um, I make sushi at home and take a a bag of frozen organic cauliflower rice. You know, it's $2.99 at Whole Foods. Microwave the rice in a a glass bowl or whatever, then add some tahini and that makes it kind of sticky. And, you know, you just roll it out just like you would do rice for sushi and you cannot tell the difference. And that is going to have zero glucose response. I've eaten tons of cauliflower rice sushi. I post this on my you know, social media and there's just really no response compared to maybe a 50, 60, 70 point response with um, with regular sushi. And, I, and you know, it, it then also just becomes a conduit for putting more vegetables and avocado inside the sushi. So that's like, that's a really healthy meal. And um, to me, I'm like, hey, I get to eat a lot more if I'm if I'm eating it this way, and, and so it's uh, it's kind of a fun hack for sushi that I've been a big fan of. I, I love the taste of cauliflower <laughs> rice. I will have to say, and I'm just still dialing this in. I get so bloated when I have raw cauliflower. So I ha- and I think that's just I did so much damage to my gut microbiome growing up. I had chronic ear infections. I and I had all sorts of issues, and my I was just on antibiotics, right? Back in the day, everybody would just pop pills, especially when you have doctors in the family. They'll say, just come, we'll give you an antibiotic and whatever. So I think I just decimated my gut bacteria. It took me years to build it back up, but there's still certain foods that cause a reaction. Again, individuality. You do great with it. I kind of get a little bit of, uh, yeah. well, not a little bit. I get a lot of bloating with it. So cooked cauliflower I love. I've tried because I saw it on your Instagram, and I was like, you know what? I haven't had cauliflower rice in such a long time. We've been having this bag from Whole Foods again that's just been sitting in our freezer. Let's try it. And um, and I, I just was uh, bloated all night. Oh, but, gosh. You know, it's a good thing for people to try if they can if they can handle it. Yeah. Biochemical individuality. It's, yeah, each thing, you know, you got to try these things. And um, when we, I think eventually when this sort of more real-time stool microbiome testing comes along, which I know there's lots of companies working on this, like it's going to be interesting to see if we can like test and figure out like what, what foods work for us from that perspective as well. So 
the other thing you guys were mentioning about sushi, just a small little hack for people, is often the soy sauce will have sugar inside yeah. of it. So, you know, if you buy it like a wheat free tamari, especially like a like a you know, or um, there's some soy sauce sort of healthier liquid alternatives, aminos. liquid aminos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, a lot of my friends will just bring that to with them to the sushi restaurant and just have it there and just pour it in their, you know, little side dish where you put the put the soy sauce in. So yeah, that's another definitely. little hack. All right. This is a big one because I feel like five, five, six, seven, eight years ago, you really saw started to see this peak, which is the acai <laughs> bowl. Acai was the superfood, uh, was one of the top superfoods of, you know, the the 2000s you would see it everywhere in all different cafes and other stuff and getting on that trend and it's all over whole foods and and stuff so talk to us about acai and um what you guys noticed about that this one was probably the most shocking to me because this was in our top 20 or actually this was in our top 40 worst scoring <laughs> logs and you this is universally i think thought of as like one of the healthiest things you could have and people are paying a lot of money for these acai bowls um and we had you know oh i think well over 100 people log these in their logs and it was a zone score of five which is essentially like a big big spike um i think what's going on here i mean acai itself is actually not a food with a lot of carbohydrates it's more of a high fat food um i think it's the things that people are adding to this and so um this is kind of going to be one of those situations where potentially you're adding tons of fruit to this bowl you're adding tropical fruits which tend to be high in sugar so mangoes. things like mangoes yeah exactly like a lot of berries oranges kiwis things like that um, papaya, uh, and not really getting a lot of fat and protein in there. So it's basically, other than the acai, which has some fat, a little bit of a naked carbohydrate bomb. Um, so if I were going to do, and, and I think it's also possible that people are adding sweetened nut milks to these things when you're like actually blending the acai. Uh, what I've found is that most coffee shops and juice bars are not using unsweetened nut milks. And so I'd probably favor making one of these at home, making the base really be more of like a green smoothie. So like spinach, kale, unsweetened nut milk, acai, maybe some fruit, um, some low glycemic fruit, build the base of the acai bowl, and then use just a little bit of fruit on top, maybe the lower the fruits that for you don't spike as much. So for me, that's going to be things like oranges, blueberries, raspberries, cherries, um, and then add the fat and protein. So like get the walnuts, the hemp seeds, the chia seeds, the coconut um, on top and just make sure it's a little bit more more balanced. Um, so it's really kind of, I think, for this one about shifting the ratios of what you're eating because there's a lot of goodness in there. But I think when it can just become too sweet forward and too sort of tropical fruit forward, that's when we get into the big spikes. Yeah. And as you mentioned, most people are not making these super acai bowls at home. You know, that's probably one of their delights is to go out on a Sunday morning brunch, whatever. We're here in Santa Monica. You could probably find at least 30, 40 <laughs> restaurants that make some version of an acai bowl within a mile of where we are in uh, the studio over here. So it's 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 being aware that when you go out, that there's not somebody necessarily looking with a lens to see the total amount of, of sugar that's going to be coming in. And some of these acai bowls, when you look at them, um, friends who have eaten them out, it, it it's almost as comparable as a soda. So that's the part to really be aware is that molecularly your body's responding like you had soda. Sure, you're getting some of the polyphenols, you're getting some you know other things inside of there too, but your body's responding on the glucose side as if you just drank a soda. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, there's definitely some restaurants that are like, you know, using this framework to create, I think about like down the street cafe gratitude, you know, restaurants that are really like very transparent about we're using unsweetened nut milk, you know, we're, we're using healthy organic fats, et cetera. And so, um, you know, kudos to those companies that are, they're doing that, but I, yeah, it is interesting, you know, people who, might be eating these things and again thinking that it's serving whatever their goal or their pain point is like there might be 
you know, women who, for instance, like going back to polycystic ovarian syndrome, like this is the leading cause of infertility in the United States. It's potentially up to 20 percent of American women are suffering from this. It's fundamentally a metabolic disease where high insulin levels are stimulating our ovaries to make more testosterone. You can imagine who is the demographic who's like eating a lot of these bowls. It's like the young women, um, child childbearing age. And might be going out and being like, this is the healthiest. I'm not getting pancakes. I'm not getting waffles. I'm getting an acai bowl. But through the lens of what we know about what's actually causing an issue like PCOS, um, that very well could not be sort of contributing to that to that goal um, of, of of easing that. Because um, it is going to, that if you're having a, a spike that big, it's going to produce some more insulin, which is going to kind of feed into the pathology. Um, so yeah, so I it's, think it's really all part of like the sophistication of wellness. And what it reminds me of a little bit is that, you know, my background is is from my ancestry is from India, and Indians in America, uh, they it's a very interesting group to to study. And we've had some people on the podcast talking about it. They typically actually are very highly educated, right? The ones that made it out here to America, they tend to be the people that were able to leave, and they got here on H one B visas and other things like that. So, they're engineers or doctors or other stuff. Not all Indians are doctors when you go to India and other places, right? So it's not that every Indian is smart. It's just the ones that made it out here tend to be from a particular population. They also, there's a huge percentage of vegetarians, mm. right? That that are part of that that group in the South Asian population as a whole. And they also have uh, one of the highest incomes. They have the highest income on average for any subset population that's inside of the United States. Why I bring all those things up is that they also suffer from the highest risk of cardiovascular health. Mm. So you see a population that is vegetarian, right? But doing it in a way that is, I'm um, doing eating anything but meat. So they tend to have a lot of, especially the region that I'm part from, uh, Gujarat, the the South Asians here in um, in America, they tend to have a lot of sugar in their foods. There's a lot of sugar. They eat a lot of fried foods, so that's a lot of vegetable oils. They're not eating actually a lot of vegetables, even though they're vegetarian. There's very little fresh vegetables yeah. that are part of the diet. They tend to be eating more processed carbohydrates. So you see now, and why I wanted to create that parallel is that that's very similar to the sort of young female who is wellness forward that made up a lot of the early wellness movement, who was probably a little bit, had access to, you know, had education, had access to uh, some disposable income and is trying to make the right dis choices for them. So you can see how two completely groups are thinking that they're doing their best, but because they're not looking at some of the baseline markers that are there, they actually could be suffering one group from major infertility. Another group could be suffering with you know heart disease and not understanding that insulin resistance is the biggest driver for, for both of them. Absolutely. You know, I think about my age group, you know, um, and some things that I was thinking about in my 20s, like things like acne or, you know, you're buying creams for for wrinkles or you're thinking about, you know, oh, stuff is stress, work is stressful, anxiety, things like this. Um, when you start to look through the lens of how so many of these things can be related to metabolic dysfunction, it's actually very liberating because you think, oh, OK, as opposed to going to, you know, the dermatologist for this or whatever and, you know, the OBGYN for this. Like you obviously need to see those doctors and like be in touch, but knowing that actually the trunk of the tree of many of these conditions is the same thing and that you can modulate that through diet and lifestyle, it's very empowering. It's like, I mean, this is the foundation of systems and network biology. Understand how conditions and symptoms are linked and then treat at that level as opposed to seeing all of them as isolated silos and then paying whack-a-mole with you know, different things like antibiotic for the acne and, and retinol cream for the wrinkles and this and that. You know, just to get really specific here, insulin and insulin-like growth factor, which are released in response to carbohydrates, glucose in the diet, those actually directly, talking about acne here, go to the hair follicle and tell the sebaceous gland, which is the oil-producing gland of the hair follicle, to produce more oil. It's a growth signal. Insulin is like a pro-growth signal, which is why it makes us overweight and store fat. It also tells growth signals to other things like the oil producing gland of the hair follicle. So when you just take away that signal through reducing, you know, the refined carbohydrates, reducing the insulin signal, your skin produces less of this oil from the spacious gland and acne clears up. That's been shown in in many, many studies that over 12 weeks you can reduce acne just by going on a, a healthy lower carbohydrate diet. 
Similar thing is true of PCOS. The insulin is stimulating the ovaries to make these male hormones. Um, and there's been a number of studies showing that healthy ketogenic diets can actually reduce um, or reverse PCOS in as little as 12 weeks. Um, that was a study actually that came out last year. And what I loved about this particular study is it wasn't just a low carb, super low carb, like processed diet. It was a healthy Mediterranean low carb diet filled with vegetables and polyphenols. And um, it was actually very low on like meat and animal protein. It was much more based on greens and and healthy fats and whatnot. Um, and then similar is true of anxiety. Studies have shown that those swings of up and down glucose can lead to anxiety. And so by actually going on a low glycemic diet, they've been shown that you can actually reduce generalized anxiety disorder sy symptoms. So the the hope of drawing this sort of like picture of how all these things are related from potentially root cause perspective and not saying that it's like glucose and carbohydrates are the thing that are causing all these conditions. It's one of the many factors that that can create conditions in the body to lead to these things. But that to me is just like empowering to know that and that we have control over that. But you're not going to get that information from your OBGYN, from your dermatologist, from your mental health provider. That's not what we're taught. It's We're not taught about nutrition. We're not taught about how to think of things on a root cause perspective. We're really not taught a systems biology framework to health in modern American you know, medical training. We're, th we're thought to think of things as separate silos. And so um, one of my hopes with these wearables and products like you know, CGM for for wellness purposes and what we're doing at levels is that when people start to see things this way, they will actually ask more of their doctors like, hey, I've been reading about all this stuff. I've been thinking about all this stuff. Like, can we talk about it from this framework? And again, just like with sort of the grassroots movement in the food industry of people asking for more because they have their data, I think the same is going to be true of what we do with doctors. We ask that we have we have this information now that we can go to them and say, Hey, I've been reading about the links between all these conditions and blood sugar. Can we here's my data. Can we can we talk about this in a real way and that it might push doctors to seek out more education on this stuff and talk to their patients about it. Um so you know what what, what was that light bulb moment for you? Right? You're you're a medical doctor. You we're going through your training. We did talk a little bit about your origin story in the last podcast, but what was that light bulb moment for you that is it's not all these individual silos. It's not acne is over here and PCOS is over here and they have nothing to do with each other. When did that moment click for you that they're all connected and you became, you know, because you're, you're an ENT, right? And, and, and so... When did you become sort of a super generalist that understood that a lot of these things are linked together through these core systems in the yeah. body? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I trained, I did five years of training in ear, nose, and throat, head, and neck surgery. And then I actually left completely. I left the field um, because I, I did have some of these, you know, realizations and realized, okay, I don't want to be operating on people. <laughs> such a morbid procedure until I really figure out whether there's more from a root cause perspective we could be doing to help people. Um, and a lot of it came down to sort of stepping back and looking at what I was doing every day. And I, we talked about this a little in our first podcast, but so much of the conditions I was treating were inflammatory conditions. It was like the sinusitis, thyroiditis, laryngitis, and itis is just, that means inflammation and in medicine. Prescribing so many steroids to quell the immune system to treat these conditions. And then when steroids and antibiotics didn't work, you take people to the operating room. And just realizing that like the opera, you know, doing a surgery doesn't change underlying upregulation of the immune system. That can only be done by addressing whatever threat the body is sensing that's creating an immune response. So I was really identify like trying to identify what is that threat. But the the light bulb moment for me was looking at all these e ENT conditions and the the real molecular biology of them. What's happening in the tissue, in the sinuses that makes them inflamed? Well, a lot of it is upregulation of immune cytokines. So things like TNF alpha, interferon gamma, gamma IL six. These are chemicals that immune cells are secreting um, and other cells are secreting to essentially create an immune response. And then when you look at all these other huge killers of Americans in the United States. Like sinusitis is not on the top 10 leading causes of death for Americans. It's not even close. It doesn't kill people. But the ones that are killing Americans, which is like cancer, 
diabetes, heart disease, dementia, all the same cytokines. It's the, you know, it's the IL-6, it's the TNF-alpha. And then saying, okay, so this is, this, and this is really talking again about systems biology. These sort of common cytokines, this Venn diagram between all these different conditions, I sort of step back and say, why aren't we treating at that level? Why aren't we thinking about what's triggering these? Because if we could bring that down, and, you know, of course, there's all these drugs that are being created to block these, you know, these immune mediators. But then you start researching a little bit more. There's a lot related to our food and our exposures and our stress that also stimulate these things. So wouldn't it make sense that we would talk to patients about that and like how to actually, you know, minimize these things? Something that was fascinating about the COVID epidemic, and I actually wrote about this in April of last year, I published a paper in the journal Metabolism about the relationship between blood sugar and COVID. One of the things that blood high blood sugar does is promote these inflammatory cytokines that I'm talking about. And those were associated with worse COVID mortality because it, what we learned early on was that it wasn't the virus that's killing people in COVID. It's the immune response to the virus. So if you're in an already baseline inflammatory, upregulated state, and then you have the virus come on board, which is also triggering the immune system, that just is this um, synergistic, huge immune response that can cause the end organ damage, you know, the the lung problems, et cetera, that ultimately cause mortality. So if you're baseline obese, diabetic, have sinusitis, all these things, um, your immune system's already revved up. That's obviously going to be a much bigger response when you get the virus. And so um, yeah, so it just that that was kind of the light bulb moment for me is like, let's look at this Venn diagram of everything that's going on and then treat at that level in the middle. And that's really what systems and network biology is. It's moving away from the reactive, silo based sort of symptom management of medicine to let's talk about cell biology. Let's talk about how our lifestyle and our diet is affecting cell biology and work towards creating conditions in the body that essentially help our cells thrive because when our cells work, our tissues work, when our tissues work, our organs work. And when our organs work, we don't have symptoms. So that's it's, really- It's a fundamental shift in how we approach medicine and even just healthy living. We're spending billions of dollars on these drugs, You know, again, well-intentioned for, let's just take for instance, Alzheimer's, yeah. right? We're spending billions of dollars looking for that one thing that is going to make a difference for for you know, patients with Alzheimer's and maybe even slowly decline. So far, there's not really anything that's working great. In fact, a, a lot of the drugs are actually making things worse. And we have to understand that it's not just one thing. These systems are all communicating together. Alzheimer's isn't just about the brain. It's also about the gut and our inflammatory pathways and you know the whole bunch of other things, including insulin resistance. So that it's a it's a different framework of thinking. It's been a little slow to, you know, percolate and get out there to the to the medical community, but that's all things in life. Yeah. You know, it's slow in the beginning, but there are a group of people and and companies that are trying to leapfrog with technology. You know, they often talk about um you know, one of the big concerns in uh, you know, in Africa originally. You know, I was I was born in Kenya and I remember discussions of how do we get telephone wire and and internet and everything else like that. Because it seems to be, from what we know, that when people have access to these communications, then commerce happens more, education happens more, and there just wasn't the infrastructure. And then mobile phones came and that whole leapfrogged the whole aspect of needing to put telephone wires up and down Africa and through all these different countries. And now through things like satellite internet, you know, we don't have to worry about cable. So more kids can get educated. People that don't have a school in their area can do that. In that same way, we're sort of leapfrogging a little bit, right? We very thankful for the medicine that's here in the United States, but it's also the most expensive medicine in the world. And it's not necessarily leading to better outcomes mm. for us. In fact, a lot of people here are sicker than other parts of the, the world that are there. So when you can get things like continuous glucose monitors, and you can have that directly to empower that information, you're dealing in the category of subclinical. You go for your, you know, you go for your yearly physical. And so many people have had this issue. You don't have a disease, right? Knock on wood, you don't have cancer yet. You don't have Alzheimer's. You're not diabetic yet, but you don't feel great. You might have a little bit of extra belly fat. Your sleep is off. You feel like 
you're not functioning the same way that you're doing it. And your friends and your family tell you that's just aging. You know, right. your gut microbiome and your in intestinal tract, you might feel bloated more often. You just chalk it up to that. And your doctor pats you on the back and says, hey, you're looking good. I'll see you next year. Maybe at most they'll tell you to lose a little weight and exercise a little bit more. And if you're smoking, tell you to stop smoking. But now we can look at all these other things between, hey, I have full-blown cancer, Alzheimer's, heart disease, and I have nothing. There's a whole vast array in the middle, which is all about optimization, which is why I'm really excited about what you guys are doing. You're really empowering people to take back control of their health. And I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is, I think, Mark Hyman talks about the FLC syndrome, which yeah. is the feel like crap, feel like crap. <laughs> which I think is exactly what you're talking about. It's sort of that in between. And um, when everyone feels like crap, we can start to think that it's like normal. Like this is just part of living in the modern world, but it's not normal. Like we all can feel amazing. We all can feel great, but we do have to, we do have to really take ownership of our, of our health. Like the systems unfortunately, are going to be slow to change, whether that's the food system, the agricultural system, the healthcare system. And so in that space, and I do think really positive forces are at play to move these industries in the right direction. Um, but in that space, that's where we need to kind of really um, take ownership and and make these choices. I mean, ultimately, our health is a function of our choices. Like health does not come from a pill. It doesn't come from a surgery. It does not come from the doctor's office. It comes from the thousands of micro decisions we make every day, week, year. And so, um, you know, my passion, and I think so many people in the wellness industry now is how do you help people make those choices in a way that's going to serve them, um, make them feel empowered and uh, be able to create those conditions in the body that ultimately make us not feel FLC feel like crap. So, um, so it, yeah, it's so true. And I, I was listening to my friend, Dr. Rungan Chatterjee's podcast recently, and um, he had a gentleman on, I think his name was Gregory McCown. I've quoted him a few times on my recent episodes and he had a great quote and it said, if you don't prioritize your life, someone else will, mm. right? Sometimes people who tend to be in the wellness world or other things, it can be chalked up to a grand conspiracy to try to control us with these processed foods, other stuff. When you study human nature and history, you realize that most of what's going on is well-intentioned people working at corporations trying to do their best with the knowledge and information that they have, right? They themselves don't know mm. about how to you know, create health for themselves or for the people that they're serving. So um, a lot of the state of the world that we're in, it's the system has gotten out of control because it was never designed intentionally. Mm. It was never designed intentionally to create, you know, uh, health. And so it's gotten out of control. So if you can step in and prioritize it with your own design, what do you want to design for your own life? What do you want to prioritize? It's design based thinking, but for yourself. And when you step into that, you become a CEO of your own health and a CEO of your own own health. It can listen to people. It can weigh options, but ultimately it's making the decisions. Cause if you don't make those decisions for you, somebody else is going to make those decisions upstream and you're just going to have to suffer with the consequences. Um, we still have a few more to get to over here. We have one more on the list of five surprising foods, but I don't want to make it uh, all. Uh, there's a lot of good news inside of what we covered, <laughs> but I also want to do. I want to touch on. You sent me a list of some of the foods that were what we call level ten scoring foods or meals, and I want to chat about that a little bit to kind of give people hope about what really happens when you dial in your food. So let's talk about the last one on the list of five surprising blood sugar spikers. And that was Thai food, pho, ramen. And tell us why those foods scored so low. So we lumped these all together. Um, Thai food, pho, ramen, you know, Chinese food, um, because they have a lot of commonalities. And one of the big ones is noodles. Um, all of those things are going to include some sort of rice or wheat-based noodle, which is essentially an ultra-refined version of a carbohydrate. And these just send people through the, you know, to the moon with glucose. And so um, I think what's so neat about a lot of these, I mean, you may love the flavors and it doesn't mean you can never eat these types of foods. It just means being a little more thoughtful when you're looking at the, the menu. So maybe it's moving away from 
the pad thai, which is going to be like a ton of noodles and maybe a sweet sauce, to actually asking like, hey, do you have a curry that's like pretty minimally sweetened? And then just eating that by itself with some good protein in there, whether it's tofu or fish or chicken or whatever, maybe avoiding the rice or just having a tiny bit of rice with an unsweetened curry. But ultimately, if the base of the meal, like a pho or a ramen or a noodle dish or a lo mein, is noodles, like it's going to just be, that's like a naked carb. It's just so much turned straight into sugar in the bloodstream. And there's some great alternatives coming. Like, uh, have you tried miracle noodles or like those kelp noodles? There's so many good ones. There's kelp noodles. There's miracle noodles. There's shirataki noodles, which are made of konjac root, which is a super high fiber um, food. Everyone in our company has tested konjac root noodles. The brands are uh, shirataki noodles and then new pasta and you pasta virtually zero glucose spike and it's just it looks identical to another type of any other type of noodle or pasta but it's made from a super high fiber um root basically it actually has one of the longest chain fibers out of any uh root that's there and so yeah. you get this um i mean it's so powerful that a lot of companies have actually turned it into like a supplement and stuff there's one that's out there called pgx that a lot yep. of people use and it's an incredible fiber source for for people. It is amazing. So I'm I'm going through a lot of new pasta these days because I'm using it like if I'm making pesto. I usually I love zucchini noodles too, but um, if I'm doing a pesto or if I'm making a, a soup at home or something like that, or even with a red sauce, like you can basically just swap it in. Um, but there's also tofu noodles. You can often ask for tofu noodles at a ramen restaurant, and then of course like zucchini noodles, yellow or green squash can work as well. Sugar and other processed foods, which you talk to most people and they say, I don't really eat sugar. I'm not eating sugar. But Andrew, it's in our food. It's in everything already. It's already in your pasta sauce. And it's already in so many of the health products that you're getting. Even if it's pure cane sugar or other stuff, it's so pervasive that's there. This is encouraging the infl- the factor of inflammation, the cycle of inflammation in the body. And that can even make you more selfish, it's more It's exactly what Austin, what Austin said. And that is that uh, you know it's actively added and this is not a conspiracy theory. We know that the statistics indicate that around 68% of the 1.2 million foods sold in the grocery store have added sweetener. That's, you know, I don't know if we can ever say that's a fact. Somebody may say, no, the world is flat, but it's, you know, if you take the foods and you look at them, you look at the labels, that's what you see. Now, you might not see sugar. You might see a high fructose corn syrup or, uh, you know, people think that, well, maybe it's okay because it's cane sugar or it came from uh, organically raised honeybees or, or maple syrup that was grown on trees that people prayed around or whatever. It's sugar and it is pro-inflammatory and it is distancing your ability to make good decisions. Mm. You know, this is part of a larger theme that's inside of the book of the new normal that's there. Can you talk to us about the new normal, the new reality that we find ourselves in today? Food is one part of that, but there's a greater topic that's part of that too. Yeah, that's that's such a good point. So where are we at? Where are we at where we're living in the United States today? Well, 70 plus percent of American adults are overweight or obese. 60 plus percent of American adults suffer from a chronic disease. Rates of anxiety are around 18% in American adults. Rates of depression are somewhere around 6%, but seem to be increasing in both adults and children. Things don't need to be this way because a lot of these are preventable diseases. And I don't want to say all of it, but we have these solutions, meaning we know certain diets. For example, the Mediterranean diet is linked to a lower risk of developing depression. We know that exercise is linked to a lower risk of developing depression. We know that we can spend time with other people and that improves our health outcomes, including our mood. So we have kind of these solutions. Now, why that's so important is, as we mentioned before, it's not the question of do we know what to do? It's a question of do we know how to follow through on these things we understand? And so the world as we see it right now could be a lot better with the available information. So much of these things are things that are a result of poor decision making. And again, to give an example, with the sugar, if you're somebody who is, you know that you shouldn't be drinking a whole bunch of soda, you know that you shouldn't be eating a whole bunch of white bread, but you do it anyway, it's not a knowledge problem anymore. It's a problem with being able to follow through on the decisions. And those decisions are a reflection of the way our brains are wired. So to take this to where we wanna go in the book, we need to get upstream. We need to get upstream of the time that you're 
sitting there looking at the apple and the donut and thinking, I know I should eat the apple, but the donut looks really good. At that point, a lot of the decision has already been made because it's determined by the way your brain is wired. We talk about inflammation. Inflammation changes our decisions. It changes our mood. It changes our entire outlook on life. And as an example of that, we now understand that inflammation may actually cause depression. And I'll take a pause there because it's something that I only recently fully grasped the significance of this, this point. We look at research where they give people either vaccinations or endotoxin, which is a part of a, a bacterial membrane, and it creates symptoms of depression, which means people feel more withdrawn from others. It means they don't want to go socialize. It means they don't enjoy life as much. So inflammation, we, we appreciate it, changes our brain. But again, as I said before, if we know that inflammation is changing our decisions, and we know that our decisions can alter the amount of inflammation in our bodies, then we can get upstream of this by making the choices today, things like exercising, things like meditating, things like even going out into nature for 20 minutes that lowers stress, and when you have lower stress, that lowers inflammation over time. These are ways we can take back our brain for better decisions and better outcomes. You know, uh, I, I was thinking of a couple things as, as we were, as Austin was talking. And uh, the first was, there's a great quote uh, when Luke Skywalker first, uh, uh, first meets Yoda. I mean, we get our information wherever we get it, right? <laughs> and Yo uh, Luke is wants to become a Jedi, and uh, he's learning how to use the lightsaber, and he's not doing a really good job. And he's, uh, Yoda says, well, you've got to, you've got to do, do, do not <laughs> That's do. That's a pretty whatever. good impression right so, there. Uh, he, uh, he says, well, I'm trying. And Yoda says, try what is try. There is only do and not do. So that's I interesting. You know, I'm thinking about that in the context of this book, Brainwash. Uh, this is for the people who look in the mirror and say, why is this happening? Why can't I make these decisions? I bought the gym membership. Why am I not going? Why am I not getting the outcome that I want? And I think that the deck is stacked against people and they don't realize it, that because of these hacks into their decision making, as we've now been talking about with respect to sugar, uh, there's many other hacks and, and we'll talk about that, but uh, it's, it's time that people stop fully blaming themselves and gaining this recognition that their ability to make and stick with better decisions has been taken from them by, as we've talked about now, sugar via inflammation, via disconnection to the prefrontal cortex. That's what inflammation does. So Austin started off first with food. David, can you pick up on that? You were talking about these other hacks. What are the other hacks that are there that are hijacking our ability to move forward on the things that we actually care about? Well, so many things, and it's, you know, truthfully, many of the lifestyle choices that you've talked about and interviewed people about uh, over the years with reference to their general health. I would say that what is thematic about basically everything that we present is the mechanism of inflammation. Yes, the same mechanism underlying chronic degenerative conditions, but now recognizing that chronic inflammation is part of disconnection syndrome is keeping you from accessing that part of your brain that allows you to plan for the future, make good decisions, stick with your decisions, and even express empathy. That is a powerful threat posed by inflammation brought on, for example, by not getting enough restorative sleep. You know, So in a way, if I could just interrupt, there's all these different streams that are out there, little rivers that then lead into this bigger river. So it could be these not getting enough sleep, not getting enough food or getting the wrong types of food that are there, all going into that main river of inflammation, all contributing to it. Yes, that. and we're gonna revisit that metaphor a little bit later because it allows us to get out of the main river into the smaller tributar uh, tributaries if we uh, just choose, for example, to change the diet, to pay attention to our exercise time in nature, relationships, meditation, sleep, etc. So, uh, you know, everybody d doesn't have to be put off by the idea that, well, I got to jump in uh, full bore here and do this entire uh, lifestyle change immediately. No. Once you change a couple of these parameters, then the decision making apparatus improves and that will foster making more and more changes. Ultimately, the whole pro the program is on board and, and people are really finally achieving a place of being satisfied with their decisions and knowing 
that their decisions are taking them to a better place. Now, we were introducing sleep. You know, we talk about um, how much time do you spend uh, exercising? How much time do you spend meditating? How much time uh, do you spend engaging with other people? Uh, those time dedications pale in relationship to the amount of time you spend or should spend sleeping. You don't spend a third of your day uh, eating or exercising unless you're training for some ultra something or other. But you spend or should spend about seven or eight hours, a third of your 24-hour clock uh, sleeping. It's that important. And yet we now know that a third of Americans don't get enough sleep, don't get adequate sleep. And, you know, it, it, it dovetails nicely what Austin was describing earlier in res uh, with respect to food, uh, that the same sort of findings are seen when people are not getting enough restorative sleep. Their decision-making apparatus is dysfunctional. And they make bad decisions, as an example. Uh, people who chronically are not getting enough restorative sleep have an average increased consumption daily of 350 calories added without any added caloric burn. So that's a net 350 more on the scale of w where you don't need those calories. And when you consider that 3,500 calories is a pound of body fat, it doesn't take much imagination to think about somebody who's chronically not getting enough sleep over six to eight months to a year, there's going to be a lot of weight gain. And that is a problem because that's fat gain. And there is a powerful association between increasing body fat and worse sleep. So that is a feed forward, no pun, well, pun intended, feed forward cycle where you're not sleeping well, you're gaining weight, and guess what? You're not sleeping well. And body fat is pro-inflammatory and uh, Austin, as he described in the book, tell us about the body fat and, and our appetite, for example. Sure, this is something that was a relatively shocking thing when I finally understood. And that is, what do our fat cells do? What do specifically our visceral fat cells do? The fat cells that we find around our belly, for example. And research has shown us that they produce chemicals. What do those chemicals do? Well, they influence our brains. They change the way we think. They change the way we make decisions. So the way I look at this is our adipocytes, our fat cells, they have this agenda. They don't want to be killed off. They want to survive. And how do they do that? Well, they tell our brains, you should be making short-term decisions. And so what we see is that BMI is correlated with higher BMI means more short-term decision-making. So again, thinking about this, your fat cells, they've got their agenda, and that is staying alive, not being destroyed by good decision-making. So they are influencing your brain to tell you, keep doing the things, eating the foods, not exercising, that will keep us going. And they all seem like such small things when you look at them individually. Oh, what's one night's sleep? Oh, right. what's a little bit of sugar? But what you both are really laying out is yeah. the effect that they have on each other and this is how people get down a downward sp side, yes, spiral. Yes, it's a great point, Drew, and that is that even one night of uh, whatever it may be, bad decision making, uh, not sleeping, or one day of, of bad eating, uh, in the aggregate, maybe it's not a big deal, but it does tend to set things up. Let's spin that. Even one week of getting better sleep, even one week of making sure you exercise every day or committing to, as we describe, a 10-day plan where you're going to meditate every day for 10 days, that is, in using your metaphor, a tributary into the, the river, an entree, if you will, to really ultimately allow uh, better decision making and it you know uh, this discussion about body fat has another pun huge implications why you know as austin was saying you know, our, our fat cells seem to have their own agenda fat controls the levels of the hunger hormone uh, ghrelin which makes us eat more and therefore we nurture our fatness and these it's like cancer cells that increase uh, angiogenesis the growth of new blood vessels and suppress the immune response around the cancer to keep them they have their agenda they want to survive though they kill the host uh, with all due respect fat cells are doing the same thing they will ultimately kill the host we know uh, that it's far more than a cosmetic issue, that visceral fat in particular, as, as Austin described, does uh, you know, increase inflammation and as such is associated with chronic degenerative conditions. And that's the number one cause of death on planet Earth. 
And when we look at each other with the fact floating in the air right now that for the, for the second year in a row, longevity in America is declining, man, that's, uh, we, we've got to, we got to re- redo some things here. We've got to get out some information that transcends giving people just uh, the idea that you need to eat this, don't eat that, and life is going to be good. No, we got to address why it is that they're not making that decision in the first place. I want to come back to something that you said, David, which was you were talking about how when individuals don't get proper night's rest, how it increases their hunger. A lot of people that are listening now, they would think, okay, if I'm not getting a good night's rest, I'm just a little bit more tired. But either one of you, could you explain like what is that mechanism that's actually happening in the body from what we know of so far that would link poor sleep to actually being more hungry the next day? Well, I'd say there are two fundamental mechanisms that we talk about in Brainwash, one being the connection between the reward system and the prefrontal cortex, and the other being the connection between a part of the limbic system called the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. And it seems that both are activated in a a bad way, let's say, by sleep deficit. So we're more likely to choose those short-term rewards because our reward system is changed when we don't get enough sleep. I think we better understand what's going on with the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex with what happens with sleep deficit. And this probably additionally contributes to what we have been talking about, which is why we choose the short-term reward. The amygdala is also linked into that reward circuit. And so what we see is that under conditions of sleep deficit, even as short as one night, there is an increased activation of the amygdala in response to threatening images. There's also, in response to a couple of nights of sleep deprivation, less connection between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. Now, why does that matter? Well, the amygdala is not a good or bad thing. It's something that has provided us amazing benefit, especially in days gone by and now in the current moment as well. But it's a threat response system. And when we don't get enough sleep, that amygdala is left to fire on its own. We become more sensitive to threats. We're trigger happy. (laughs) Exactly. I I think of it kind of as an alarm system, right? It tells us when something might be going wrong. And the prefrontal cortex has to come over and say, hey, don't worry about it. Things are okay. And maybe adjust the sensitivity. But when that connection between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala is broken down, which is what happens under conditions of sleep deficit, then you have this alarm blaring in the background all the time. Your stress response is constantly going off. When that happens, you increase cortisol, you increase other hormones, and it puts you in a position where you're more likely to make short-term decisions. From an evolutionary perspective, this actually makes sense. When you're under a condition of stress, which in our past would have been more of an acute stress as opposed to a chronic stress, you need to make a quick decision. You don't want to be sitting there thinking about what will the weather look like three days from now. You're thinking about how do I get away from the saber-toothed tiger this moment. But when you're sitting there for hours, for days, for months, and for some people for years, your decision making is going to stay in that short-term focus. And what does that mean? Well, you're going to be making those impulsive decisions like eating those extra calories. The unfortunate thing with sleep deficit is we see this happening after one night. So that one night staying up late, watching Netflix, look, I get it, Netflix is wonderful, but it comes at a cost, and that cost is better decisions. I wanna zoom out for a second and talk about this term that you guys have coined, which is disconnection syndrome. And help us understand what it is and how everything we've talked about fits into the context of this term. Well, a syndrome, by definition, is, uh, it constitutes a lot of nuances. So it means we can use this term disconnection syndrome in a very uh, literal way and a very figurative way. In a very literal way, it's exactly what Austin's been talking about, disconnection between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, keeping the adult out of the room, basically leaving the kids at home for the weekend with 30 of their closest friends while mom and dad go on a cruise bad idea. We need to have the parents at home to help make the decisions, what to eat, when to go to bed, all the things that happen. That's what we are disconnected from, the ability to make uh, good decisions, to plan for the future, to act compassionately towards other people, to embrace empathy. So in the strictest sense of our application of this new term, disconnection syndrome, that's what we refer to. But in the broader sense, it is a disconnection 
that is induced upon us because we're disconnecting, for example, from the messaging of our DNA. When we eat fruits that are not um, what our DNA is used to seeing, we increase inflammation, we enhance uh, free radical stress, we compromise detoxification. So we're disconnecting from these pathways in our genome that are set up to keep us healthy. You know, that's sort of one of the fundamentals of the so-called paleo movement, to kind of honor uh, our paleolithic genome and allow it to express itself. We disconnect from the messaging of our microbiome. We do so by eating foods that are not good for us, taking various medications that are threatening the microbiome. We're disconnecting from these life-sustaining signals and metabolites that our gut bacteria are producing to keep us healthy. Uh, and even more broadly, because of all this happening, because of our disconnection from the prefrontal cortex, then we are disconnecting from each other. We are disconnecting from personal interaction. We are disconnecting from conceiving of the future and disconnecting from our concern over even the health of the planet. So our m main mission in bra uh, Brainwash is reconnection on all of the levels that just were presented. Most importantly, reconnecting to that part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, which is our gift. You know, that and having an opposable thumb really kind of define us in terms of being different from other animals. I mean, a third of the brain cortex is prefrontal cortex. In, uh, in chimpanzees, I think it's 17%. It's a much lower number. So it's not that it's not represented in other primates or other mammals, but we've got this incredible ability to plan for the future to make better decisions. And, uh, you know, the, the revelation for us that so many aspects of our, our modern life, like our digital experiences, for example, are tending to pull us away from connecting to the prefrontal cortex and locking us into that part of the brain that is far more involved with short-sightedness and narcissism. Hey YouTube, if you enjoyed this mashup, you're gonna love this interview with my friend, Sean Stevenson on the top foods to boost your brain health. We don't often see much improvement when people have cognitive decline associated with Alzheimer's, but they saw simply by getting folks magnesium levels up. They saw that their brains aging reversed, their cognitive ability improved, 